Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A-Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video you can already guess by the balance of all the rocks that I have put here on the slide that we are discussing homeostasis. This is chapter 14 of the A-Level Biology syllabus. So please, um, if you haven't been following all the previous videos, know that I'm doing everything in chronological order so you can follow the videos by chapter. Something else I want to say before we get into into homeostasis, which by the way is a really long chapter, uh, but also one of the most interesting ones. Something I want to say is that I have used the playlist function on YouTube to arrange the videos by chapter. So it means that if you're looking for only videos on chapter one, you can just go to the playlist and watch just chapter one and you'd see all the videos on chapter one. And I've done that for every single chapter except chapter nine because chapter nine is just one video. Um, so you can just seek it out by typing in chapter nine in the search uh, box and you would be okay with it. So I thought that would be helpful for those of you who are trying to like go in for specific chapters. Um, it would help you to understand. I also have a playlist for past question papers. So you can just go there if you're trying to see how some past papers have been solved and you would be able to find some videos on that as well. All right, let's get into homeostasis. All right, first things first, what is homeostasis? Um, homeostasis is often defined as the control of an internal of the internal conditions in an organism such that everything is around a set range. Um, and so we, we basically say it's being kept close to a constant. And there are many factors that we control using homeostasis. Examples are your core body temperature. For example, you know that the human body um, is expected to be around 37 degrees. Uh, but that's usually around a range of, of about 36 um, to 37.5 um, and you'd still be fine. We also control things like our metabolic wastes, uh, we control blood pH, we control blood glucose concentration, we control water potential of the blood. I just want to say from this specific slide that the key ones you have to know for this chapter are body temperature, which is called uh, thermoregulation. You also have to know about blood glucose concentration and water potential of the blood. So those are the three key parts that we are going to focus on for the purpose of this syllabus. But before we go in, I want to um, zoom in on some definitions that you certainly have to know. Um, the first one is what a receptor is. So when we discuss homeostasis, we often talk in terms of receptors, stimulus, um, effectors, and um, a set point, and also the negative feedback loop. A receptor is what detects a change in stimulus or a change, uh, what detects a stimulus rather, or a change in a physiological factor. So say, for example, you walk into a very hot room um, and you're, you're trying to pick something up there. And if you remain there for quite a while, your brain detects that there's a change in temperature. There's a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. That would then be the receptor because it detects the change in temperature and it sends signals to different parts of the body to respond appropriately. The second one is what is called an effector. An effector is like a response unit and it responds to things that have changed within your environment. So say, for example, and this is an example that I use in my classroom, um, that oh, we're all sitting in the classroom, we're having a conversation about homeostasis and all of a sudden um, someone sees a lion approaching the class. By the way, this is highly unlikely. Uh, we don't leave um, <laughs> we're in a place where lions would um, find us. But let's say that just hypothetically speaking, some of us, um, someone sees a lion coming in. The eyes that see the lion would be the receptors and they send a message quickly to the brain to say, oh my goodness, there's danger coming towards us. The brain then sends these signals um, through um, different mechanisms to the effectors, which would be the legs, assuming that this person would just run away. That's if they're not overwhelmed. So in that case, the legs, the muscles and the legs would be the effectors because they are responding to the stimulus. A stimulus is just a change that initiates a response. So it can be a change in your blood glucose concentration, for example. So if you've gone out and you've eaten a very um, highly nutritious meal um, that's full of your carbohydrates, proteins, and basically all your macros, uh, your, your body detects that as a change because uh, probably before that you haven't eaten anything. So that's an increase in blood glucose. And so it would initiate um, a response. And then we have what we call the set point. 
the set point is like the ideal value for a physiological um, factor. Um, and we say ideal value because most of the time physiological factors don't stay at one fixed value, they stay within a fixed range. Uh, for example, body temperature, you might find that when you go out um, and you take your temperature with the thermometer, sometimes you're at 36 degrees and sometimes you're like at 37.2. That doesn't mean that your body is not functioning right. Even though we say that the ideal body temperature is 37 degrees, there's actually an ideal range at which things are okay. The last one is the negative feedback loop, and that is just a system through which a physiological factor undergoes a change and is then restored back to its set point. But as we discuss further, you will understand these much more. So let's have a look at how homeostasis works. Just the outline, and this outline is typically what we call the negative feedback loop or the negative feedback mechanism. So we've already defined all of these terms, the receptor, the stimulus, the effector, and so on. So what happens? A receptor will detect a stimulus, which means it would tell something is different. Um, for example, if you go and you eat like a big bowl of rice, um, then your body just says, oh, you know, I've received a lot of sugar. That The stimulus is the rice that you've taken in, and you, uh, the receptor would then be the cells that are responsible for detecting that. The receptors will then send a message to the central control parts of the brain or the spinal cord that then says, listen, there's a lot of rice in the body, um, and that means the blood glucose concentration is high, um, something needs to be done. The brain then sends a message to an effector. And what an effector does, just like we said, is that it responds to a stimulus in order to bring corrective action. And so the effector causes a restoration back to normal. And homeostasis is a continuous process. So it means that most of the factors within our body would remain within that set point or what you can call a set range. This is what we call the negative feedback loop. Um, and I think I have a diagram of it, so you'll be able to see it, um, it um, described in an illustration. And the negative feedback just simply ensures that the actual value and the change um, is kept to a bare minimum. So it tries as much as possible to always restore any change in physiological factor back to normal. We also have what we call the positive feedback loop. And the positive feedback loop reinforces the change that is happening. That's the difference between the two. While the negative feedback detects a change and says, oh, I need to take this change back to normal or back to the set point, Positive feedback sort of reinforces the change that is happening. So say, for example, you go for a run in a place that has a high CO2 concentration and you're breathing in CO2, you're taking in air that has CO2. What your body would then say is, I need a lot of oxygen, but there's no way for your body to sieve oxygen out of the air on the outside of itself. So you have to keep breathing in more air to get more oxygen. That is a positive feedback because it's saying continue with the action that you're doing. Yes, we're getting CO2, but we're also getting oxygen. And so that would be an example of a positive feedback loop or positive feedback mechanism, actually. It's not a loop. Okay, so how does homeostasis work? Again, just to repeat it, but with an illustration. So here we have the set point of a physiological factor. Now a stimulus comes in. So let's say, for example, you decide to um, go into the cold room at work uh, because you need to retrieve some biological samples. The stimulus would hit um, that, um, that cold air that hits your body is the stimulus and it sort of affects the set point because you start to get a bit chilly. The receptors um, would then sense the stimulus um, or the change in set point and send a message to the control center of the brain. Once that message is sent, the brain will then send a signal to an effector and the effector will respond to the change, which will then restore the value back to its set point. So this is called the negative feedback loop. Positive feedback just reinforces whatever is happening, which means that there's a stimulus and the set change is affected. The receptor, the receptor senses that there's a change that has happened, but it continues to reinforce the change. So it says just keep going um, because this is necessary for the functioning of the body. 
So usually another question that um, I often let students or something I often let students know is that homeostasis is, con is coordinated by a complex system. As a matter of fact, not just one system, more than one of them. So you have the endocrine system, for example, that is involved in homeostasis. And you also have the central nervous system that is involved in homeostasis. So sometimes you would find that when homeostasis is occurring, the response is the secretion of a hormone, or it could be something that has to do with the muscles. Um, and so these two systems work together to ensure that homeostasis happens as it should and that physiological factors stay within their set range. So with that said, uh, we will now zoom in on one aspect of homeostasis, which is thermoregulation. I think at the beginning, I mentioned to you that the three core sections that you have to know um, are thermoregulation, osmoregulation, which is control of water potential in the body, and control of blood glucose. You also have to know homeostasis in plants. Um, so that's a different video entirely, but for now, let's just look at thermoregulation. So when it comes to thermoregulation, we are speaking about control of the body temperature. And the part that detects it is this part in orange here. So here, I think I have to use a white pen. Um, and it's called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus basically receives inputs um, with regards to the body temperature, as well as temperature of the surrounding environment. So it monitors the core temperature of the body by sort of measuring the temperature of blood as blood flows through the hypothalamus. Um, so that way it's able to keep the body at a set temperature. It will also receive information from receptors on the skin. So the skin is known as, a, as an early warning um, signal receptor because once you get into a cold room, the first reason why you feel cold is because your skin um, feels cold and it sends a message to say, okay, things are a bit chilly over here. And that obviously is before your blood even gets cold. So we call that an early warning. Morning, um, by the skin. So now let's look at what happens when the core temperature of the body or the temperature of the surroundings um, start to decrease. So think about it like you're in the lab, in the undergraduate lab, and you have gone to retrieve some of your experimental samples from the four degrees Celsius room. First thing that would happen if you happen to stay there for a while is that your muscles, um, your blood vessels will start to constrict. So this is what we call vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction simply means constriction of the blood vessels. So everywhere you see the word vaso, that refers to blood vessels. So it means constriction of the blood vessels to prevent heat loss from the blood. Um, so just making sure that everything sort of stays close together so that less heat is lost by the blood. Um, um, to the surroundings. You also have um, the hairs on your skin standing, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when you're cold, you get goosebumps, and the hairs on your skin will stand. The reason for that is that the muscles contract, and when they contract, they cause the hairs to stand so that the hairs are able to trap air close to the skin. And this way, it prevents heat from being lost to the surroundings um, and helps to trap air close to the skin. So the air just um, keeps you a little bit warm. It's like trying to form a layer of warmth around you. The last thing that happens, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this before, is shivering. Uh, when you're really cold, you just find yourself going, Ugh. that's because your skeletal muscles are contracting involuntarily, and that contraction or that action produces heat, which is then absorbed by the blood. Um, so other things that would happen, you would have things like sweat production would decrease because you don't need to sweat. You don't need to lose any heat um, in any way. And you'd also have an increase in the sequence of adrenaline. The reason adrenaline is increased when core temperature drops is because adrenaline increases metabolism and whenever you have metabolism happening you also have heat production. Now when core temperature of the surroundings increase you have the opposite of these things. For example you would have vasodilation, you would have increase in sweat production, you would have decrease in the secretion of adrenaline. So I haven't made a slide for that but I'm just putting it out there because um, you can see here over here, this is vasodilation. This only applies when temperature increases because now the body is trying to get rid of excess heat so it will cause the dilation of the um, blood vessels so that you can lose more heat to the environment. 
Now let's look at what happens when um, the surrounding temperature decreases. But I mean, we've already just said that we have vasoconstriction and we have decrease in sweat production. But I'm what I'm trying to do with this slide is also to help you see how the central nervous system and the endocrine system connect with each other. The endocrine system is the system that controls the secretion of hormones in the body. And so we need to see how those two are connected to control body temperature. So let's start. This is going to be, I'll try to number these um, so that you can see which ones to follow. This is number one over here. Now when core temperature or um, surrounding temperature decreases, the hypothalamus, which happens to be in the brain, and the brain is part of the central nervous system, will detect the change. Remember, it is the receptor for body temperature. It detects the change and then it releases a hormone that simulates the anterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland is part of the endocrine system. So it is basically a hormonal system. The anterior pituitary gland will then secrete the thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone is very important in increasing metabolism. I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but there are usually issues whereby when people have uh, problems with their thyroid, their metabolism decreases significantly because the thyroid is not functioning as it should. So the anterior pituitary gland secretes the thyroid stimulating hormone, um, also called TSH. So this is um, number two. TSH will then stimulate the thyroid gland um, to release thyroxine into the blood. Thyroxine will increase the rate of metabolism, which will then increase heat production in the liver. So when temperature starts to increase again, then the hypothalamus will reduce the release of TSH so that there'll be less thyroxine produced from the thyroid gland. The point of this is to let you know that when temperature decreases, your body actually starts to stimulate an increase in metabolism in order to produce heat. And this is often done if you're in a situation where you're in a hypothermic state, which means that the temperature is really, really cold and the body is trying as much as possible to keep you alive. This is where it ends for thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is very straightforward, very easy, and you usually get questions that are about five marks from it. Um, so please make sure you study it. If you have, if this has flown through your head, like just past your head, please try to watch it again. I'm sure you'll find it helpful. And if you have any questions, post them in the chat. The next section is about how the body makes urine and regulates water in the body. And I know that is one of the complex sections students struggle with. So I am going to try as much as possible to just slow down with that section and explain things in detail so that they are easy for you to follow. Thank you so much for watching. Until the next video, have a good time. Goodbye.